Hi, Paresh, how are you? Uh, you need to switch your microphone on, actually. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. How are you, Paresh? Doing well. Where are you at right now? Are you in uh, okay? I'm in, I'm in London, yeah. I'm in London. Good to you. It's not Sorry, that late. It's just been... Uh, luckily, I made it back into the country just before the... Problems. Just before the problems started. Just one second, huh, Paresh. Let me just uh, link this to YouTube. Give me one second. At all. Oh, it's too bright. Just trying to link you to all the different uh, websites. We'll turn that light on and see what happens. Yeah, it's, it's good to have a, a table lamp in front of you, Paresh, so your face lights up. I'll show you mine, so you know, I'm, sure. I'm very brightly lit. So, okay, we'll turn that so on. have a table lamp in front of you on your table that will light up. Uh, so, if, if can you see the green button at the bottom which says share screen? Yes. Yeah, so just press that and it will give you options. If your PowerPoint is open on your, on your desktop, then it will give you an option to share PowerPoint. So it says uh, host disabled participant screen uh, sharing. Okay, one minute. I will just have a look. I may have. I haven't disabled you, but let me see. Allow. Just let me go into the settings. Just one second. So have they started elective surgery in England now? Uh, no, not yet. No, no. They will. They will probably start by the end of this month. I think. Uh, at the moment, no. Just one second. Let me get this out. I have not disabled you. I don't know why it's. Should I log back in? Uh, no, just hang on. Just one minute. Let, let me just get into the settings and I'll just see because I have not disabled, but uh, sometimes it does. Uh, you know, today uh, Zoom has been having problems, so I'll try and see if I can undo this. Uh, Money, no unique host, allow record. No, we don't want that. Okay, mute and participant, allow participant to unmute. Website and work it out. Don't do this. Uh, my account. 
<laughs> this thing is so silly. Yeah. What I should have had is a uh, facing the well, window. I have not actually disabled you for it. Can you try again? Yeah, the same thing. Really? Uh, okay. So the other way out is I will make you the host and then you can share your. I'm going to just make you the host, yeah, so then you can share your So now you are the host, so see if you can share again. Oh, yes. So click on share screen and see if you can share your screen. Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's good. I'm going to reclaim the host, okay? Sounds because good. I need to be I need to be able to switch off people who log in. Uh, because while you're giving the talk, I, I I make sure that the surrounding is quiet for you. Because this is a meeting, then people you know start uh, doing <laughs> silly things on the meeting, so you got to control them. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, we're 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 doing fine. So we've got the relay going on. Uh, just one second. I know that people asking me a lot of questions on the site. Uh, OBD. Sorry, Paris, just one second. I'm sorry, I'm trying to. No, no, take it. We, we're, we're reeling to multiple centers, so. I, I'm just trying to get all the links in place so that everybody can go. How are things with you, Paresh? Otherwise, everything is okay. Yes, everything is good. I mean, as you know, Massachusetts was hit pretty badly. I know. I saw that. Yeah. Just just so, yeah. So, well, the commonest procedure for me these days is that, like, you asked me. <laughs> it's amazing, you know, how they are asking you to. <laughs> but did you have to actually look after COVID patients uh, in the. Yes. I did a few ICU shifts, but uh, uh -huh. it's pretty amazing how, how crowded the hospital is. I mean, on an average, there will be anywhere between 60 to 200 patients. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I'm also worried about elective cases getting infected, you know. Uh, oh, yes. That's a big issue, isn't it? So yes. what about what about PPE and stuff like that? Are you, are you, are you no, okay with that? PPE, the, the thing is, in general, the culture is to be very wasteful, right? So, you know, for one case, we would end up using six pairs of gloves and something like that. And so, oh, so in general, the approach, the, the tendency is to be wasteful. So I think if you cut back a little bit on that, that is adequate PPE, at least now really? there is. Oh, yeah. well, when, when they started, there was a real problem, wasn't there? Yes, because you know, suddenly uh, there was a tremendous need mm -hmm. and uh, the, the government did not catch up with it. So, but you know, the, uh, it, it's okay now. I mean, it's not, it's not like before, you know, there would be N95s all over the place, but now 
we have to ask for it, or it'll be with the nursing supervisor somewhere. And oh, I see. It's a while to get there. Did, did you have any staff who were uh, sort of affected? Yes, I mean there was one one particular person I knew who landed up on a ventilator, but he hmm. survived. Um, you know, we've had a series of residents. Um, at any time between two to three of them getting sick and staying at home. Okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah, there is a, I mean, it's still there. No, but did they, did they test positive? Yes. Oh God, it's yes. real concern, isn't it? Real concern, yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, it's, not, it's not going away anytime soon, I think. Um, That's true, that is absolutely true. Uh, it's a, uh, so uh, trying to do elective stuff um, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, it is, I've already started doing between myself and my senior colleague. Mm -hmm. We do one or two cases a day, but we have started doing because you can't wait that long. You know. But but is is the hospital supporting you in doing elective work? Uh, in a, so the ACS guidelines always included uh, approval for cancer patients. Mm -hmm. So things like lobectomy, staphylococcus, that sort of thing is continuing. Uh, empyema, um, metastatic staging procedures, and those sort of things that are continuing, yes. It's just, uh, it's not as, you know, previously we would, if there was a lung mass, we wouldn't even biopsy, we would go by our clinical intuition. Usually we were right about it, but now we would, we'll buy a biopsy and we'll wait and make sure the things are all sorted out before taking them to the OR. But are you are you sort of are the patients coming to the hospital? I thought patients would not want to come to the hospital. Isn't it? Well, scenario. two things. Firstly, uh, usually, as we all know, you know, there's a lag time of anywhere between, in spite of being in America, there's a lag time of I would say minimum of two weeks to sometimes a month before they land up for the operating room. Uh huh. The PET scan and the PFTs and yeah, all that. Yeah, sure. So, so there was when and, and so in mid March when they stopped, there was already a bunch of people waiting. So there was oh. a backlog there, and we were booking maybe two to three weeks out. So there was a backlog there, and then mm -hmm. what has happened is because patients don't want to come in, uh, now there is a backlog because they all come into the emergency rooms. Oh you know, my God! Large small cells, and I biopsy a couple who showed up through the emergency room, pleural effusions malignant effusions that are coming through the emergency room. So yes, um, it has I mean, been. Yeah, but, but uh, are, are, you, are you taking complete precaution with every patient, symptomatic or not, or are you no. sort of going with? So the new uh, recommendations, at least uh, from the hospital systems are, we get a PP, sorry, we get a COVID test within 48 hours. Uh -huh. So anybody who comes in for surgery, when they come for the PAT, uh -huh. will get a COVID test. Oh, so, I see. Okay. Uh, so that's mandatory. They don't get surgery, yes. Is it easily available, the COVID test? Now it is. Okay. It is now. It is now fairly, not the rapid one, but the one that takes the turnaround of anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. That mm -hmm. one is and, that one's easily available, yes. And, fact, and what's, who's uh, paying for it? Is the government paying for it or is the patient paying for it? So they put things into place with the... With the Congress put some things in place where it's all free. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the insurance companies get involved, but they'll get reimbursed quickly. Um, and so, you know, nowadays, at least in Massachusetts, in, in Cambridge, for instance, they have uh, they have said that anybody who wants a test can get a test free. Oh, really? So they have ramped up, at least in this state, the testing. What, what was the cost of the test, though, in, in, if you had to pay for it? Uh, so I don't know the cost of the test. It was always free any time I took it. But the antibody test, um, the IgG antibody test, uh -huh. uh, is $119 from Quest. Oh, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. No. So that's, no, yes. I, I yeah. thought it would be something more than that. But that's all right. I'm not reliable, yeah. It's not oh, reliable. that's the problem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reliability is a big issue. Isn't it? I mean, the, I don't know how they're going to open schools and restaurants and all because they'll have to, they'll have to really ramp up testing where everybody gets tested first. Um, and unless that happens, 
I think that it will be very difficult. The other day, Asun and I, we had gone to this golf course and the, the way they do it is you kind of every 15 minutes they let you in. They only okay. give you one cart per person. Okay. Um, the restaurant is closed and the parking lot is filled with people because uh, oh. everyone's waiting in line to get in. <laughs> So the, your, your kids your kids are at home or schools, colleges are shut down? So or? All colleges got shut down in March. So they ended up, everything moved online for them. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then there is this argument now about when to restart. Some people have already committed to waiting till spring of 2021. Boston University, for instance, they waited till spring of 2021. Nobody else has committed, but Northeastern is talking about starting this fall. All right. I think it will depend on what kind of courses, say lab-based courses, where people have to sit in the lab and conduct experiments and all that. I think they'll be forced to start earlier, but anything that can happen online will be online. But, you know, it's easier said than done, this whole social distancing thing. Um, the reality is it's not practical for everything that we do. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, like, for instance, I did a, uh, what was a Thursday, there was this guy with a 3A lung cancer left up a lobe. I did an open uh, lobectomy and we had to go intrapericardial because of all the scarring and the nodes and all that. Mm -hmm. And so intrapericardial and we were able to avoid a pneumonectomy and we were able to avoid a sleeve, but he ended up uh, in the hospital, he got sick. Uh, he's doing better now, but his wife was not allowed to come in to see him. Oh God. So, so they rely heavily on the staff calling and their staff's already overwhelmed with doing things. So it's not very, uh, so they're not happy, the family members, because they're- I can imagine, I can imagine. Yeah. It's a very difficult situation, isn't it? Too? Yeah, yeah. But that's, the, I think that's the new way now. I mean, I don't see a way around this because- I, 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 I think our life is gonna completely change now, isn't it? With you? Yes. I think- uh, Going forward, this is going to be the norm. I think, I think this IAC, IACTS course that you're doing is uh -huh. fantastic. I mean, it is an amazing concept. I think you're, you're way ahead of the curve already. It's uh, working very well, actually. Yeah. We started early, actually. So it was good. And uh, we've had tremendous response, you know, tremendous yeah. response. And uh, a lot of people are logging on online, uh, YouTube. Uh, various yes. channels, uh, we're relaying live onto the websites of the society. So yes. We're having tremendous response. And, and so far, you know, we've done, this must be, I think, 60, 64th or 65th lecture. Wow. That, that, so that's not bad, isn't it? I mean, and that is only thoracic. And cardiacs have done another 50, 60 lectures, so. Amazing. I think, no, I I think, think uh, uh, you guys are ahead of the curve because I don't think these people have caught up with it. And um, uh, you know, the, in America, there's no such thing. At AATS, I think they're doing something online, but not to the same level. But what this does is it allows everybody to have an opinion. It allows everybody to independently listen to others' opinion from across the globe. Yeah, and absolutely. I think that's what good conferences are all about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the thing is, you are in the comfort of your own home, you know, and uh, yes. like, like, like a lot of people who log in are going to be from India, uh, but many countries, but India, Indians are logging in a lot and it, time is 9.30 in India. They've had their dinner, they're sitting nicely you know, in the comfort <laughs> of their home, logging in. Uh, yeah, no traveling and, and they get to talk one on one with somebody like you, you know, they would never get to see you personally, but this forum will give them an opportunity to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. So, oh, the pleasure is all mine, trust me. Yeah. I'm sure they have a lot to, and there's a lot yeah. that people do in the, in the silence of their own world that we never hear yeah. of. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's, it's been a great forum actually. And touch wood, Zoom has worked very well for us so far. Right. Zoom only allows hundred though, isn't it? They only allow. No, you 100. can you can up, you can upgrade. This. So it starts with the hundred on a basic package, then you go on to a professional package that gets you hundred but unlimited minutes, and then you can go up to ten thousand if you want. You, you just have to pay for everything. But the only problem is that you don't pay per session. 
you pay for the month so oh. that is why you know you cannot sort of you know one meeting could be 10000 and one meeting could be 20 so it's it's not worth uh, doing it right. on the whole thing right. so they don't allow you to upgrade just for that one meeting so that that is the only issue with it. so like i have a professional account with them so i pay a wow. certain amount for this uh, for using this platform and then yeah. last month we were doing webinars so i was paying them extra for doing it as a webinar but webinar is not as much fun as one on one interaction with you so, yes. but the only thing is i have to moderate because people leave their microphones on and things like that so i have to quickly switch it off all right so yes. i think the time is five o'clock i am going to just start recording first so that's the first thing i do so good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, welcome to yet another session of uh, thoracic gurus uh, today, we are really fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Paresh Mane. Uh, Dr. Paresh Mane is a attending uh, thoracic surgeon at Tufts uh, Medical Center, uh, a steward medical group, Boston MA. Uh, he is a very well-known uh, person in the field of minimally invasive foregut surgery. His fields of other fields of interest include robotic surgery, lung cancer screening, and of course, lung, uh, you know, uh, VATS and robotics, lung cancer surgery. Uh, Paresh, we are very, very happy to have you with us. Uh, Dr. Mane, we, the audience is a mixed bag. Uh, a lot of them are exam going people who are either doing their MCH or they're doing a DNB, which is a national board exam, or they are doing the FRCS cardiothoracic surgery. You are going live into about 15 countries at the moment. And uh, these, uh, these youngsters will be asking you some questions at the end of the session, if that's okay. Uh, yes. We also have a lot of senior surgeons on the group who have logged in, I can see them. And uh, everybody is interested in knowing about esophageal cancer. Uh, this was the hot topic that everybody has been asking me repeatedly. Today is the 62nd uh, lecture of this series over the lockdown period. So welcome to this group and please take it over. Thank you very much, uh, Samir. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, a few uh, housekeeping items here. How do I find out who is asking the question? Do I go to YouTube? I, I, I will moderate it for you. Okay. So you don't yeah. have to worry about the questions. Yes. I will take all the questions and I will ask you those questions. So Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So um, uh, esophagus cancer is a pretty large topic. And what I've tried to do uh, over the next, what I'm trying to do over the next hour is try to uh, summarize the important concepts about how we manage it, um, how I manage it, what are the current views. And then um, uh, we can always uh, respond to specific questions with regards to the minutia, the details in terms of the different operations and stuff. But the, the, the goal of this lecture is to try to summarize the current thinking um, uh, in an hour about esophagus cancer. So uh, I'm a general thoracic surgeon. Uh, I'm a trained cardiothoracic surgeon. I'm board certified in cardiothoracic surgery and uh, general surgery. But out here in the United States, you have to choose your track between being a cardiac surgeon versus being a general thoracic surgeon. And uh, I am a general thoracic surgeon. Uh, I practice in, uh, uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a group of eight hospitals. And me and my partner, we cover a bunch of these. Um, and esophagus surgery is a, is a significant part of my practice. I would say at least about 30 to 40% of my practice is benign and malignant esophagus surgery. And so uh, I, I, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk about my experiences with esophagus cancer. So uh, some of this data in terms of the epidemiology is related to the Western world. I know it's not entirely fair to extrapolate these numbers to what we see in India, but I'm trying to get some accurate numbers and there are a couple of slides further down that will depict some of those numbers in India, but the numbers that you see are more specific to the United States. So when we talk about esophagus cancer, um, there, there are some nomenclature issues here. Um, the view of esophagus cancer in, in, the, in the eastern part of the world would be 
esophagus is an organ, so the upper one third, middle one third, and the lower one third. In India, you see a lot of upper one third esophagus cancer because it's part of the head and neck squamous cell cancer world. You also see a lot of mid thoracic esophagus cancer. But in the United States and the, in, in Europe, you are more likely to see distal esophagus cancer. So you will, you will see terminologies used where uh, there'll be talks given on GE junction or esophageal gastric cancer. And while they, are, while they mean to comment on esophagus cancer per se, it is a slightly different entity. And I've tried to incorporate that in today's talk. The reason why I bring that up is if you look at these numbers here, uh, males versus females, the commonest cancer is lung, 26% in females and 28% in males. And as far as males go, GE junction cancer, this distal esophagus cancers, falls a little bit behind pancreatic cancer. So about five to 6% of all cancers in men. Uh, and in females, it is actually a little bit behind uterine cancer, about less than 3% in females. So it's a reasonably uncommon thing in the United States, reasonably compared to other cancers. In fact, every year, roughly about 8,000 esophagectomies get done in the United States. That's not that common. But when you look at the numbers in India, and I got this data from this website, uh, which is a government website, and the numbers are amazingly different. For instance, if you look at um, the new cancer cases, esophagus ranks just a little bit behind lung. So that kind of seems very odd. And I, and, and I have a feeling that has something to do with a lot of these upper esophagus cancers being grouped at, eso being grouped at esophagus cancers because their association with uh, head and neck and squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck. It's also interesting to me that the mortality of esophagus cancers, especially in India, is extremely high. For instance, in the year 2018, there were 52,396 new cases. And the same year, there were 46,504 deaths. So the mortality is extremely high. So that seems to me uh, patients are presenting very late and they don't really have access to care to identify these cancers early. Uh, <clears throat> broadly speaking, esophagus cancers fall in two categories. One is the um, squamous cell carcinomas, and the other one is adenocarcinomas. Globally, esophagus cancer, if you look at Egypt and the Middle East and uh, China and Japan and India and Bangladesh, and you put them all together, esophageal gastric cancers are common. I mean, they would say about 1.3 million cases a year. That's even more than lung. I have a feeling lung doesn't get adequately diagnosed, but that's why the numbers are higher. Uh, they're much, much more common in China and India compared to the United States. And the fatality rate, as I mentioned earlier, is high. Uh, on the other hand, um, adenocarcinomas are increasingly more common in the United States compared to squamous cell carcinoma. In fact, of all the esophagus cancer patients that I deal with, 75% um, of them are adenocarcinomas and they tend to happen in the distal esophagus. It's not, it's unlikely to find adenocarcinomas um, in, um, in, in India and, 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 and uh, the Southeast Asian population. Um, in terms of the risk factors, Squamous cell carcinoma more likely to be associated with alcohol, tobacco chewing, low socioeconomic status, African American population, achalasia, patients with achalasia at a higher risk of squamous cell carcinoma rather than adenocarcinoma. This is for the ones taking the board exams. Uh, cultural patterns, um, eating spicy food, eating, uh, drinking hot beverages like hot tea, hot coffee. Uh, high nitrosamines, pickled foods, all of these are associated with uh, a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, adenocarcinoma, on the other hand, is a very different disease. It is more likely to be associated with reflux problems. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a problem of uh, is a problem of uh, modern age. You know, uh, obesity, alcohol, smoking. 
um, not exercising enough. So the, all these things lead to high degree of reflux. Once you have reflux, you're likely to develop Barrett's esophagus. Once you have Barrett's esophagus, that can lead to high-grade dysplasia, and high-grade dysplasia can lead to an adenocarcinoma. So uh, if you look at this picture over here, um, Barrett's esophagus is essentially, it's a metaplasia. It's a replacement of the normal squamous epithelium of the esophagus with an intestinal columnar epithelium. So, um, you know, uh, that's one of the early phases. So not all Barrett stones into cancer. This initial metaplasia will then change into low-grade dysplasia, then become a high-grade dysplasia. That becomes adenocarcinoma in situ and finally adenocarcinoma. And there's a 2% risk of developing malignancy over a 10-year period if, we, if somebody has Barrett. So that's a very important number when patients show up in the office and they have reflux and they're making a case to do surgery on them. Um, uh, you know, that's a number to, to code. That's not to say that it, you know, once somebody has Barrett's uh, and you do a listen on them, the risk goes down because it's still debatable whether doing a listen from the application takes away uh, the Barrett's. I think the Barrett stays, it's a permanent change. There are other influences that matter uh, because there is some element of uh, genetic predisposition for esophagus cancer. P53 mutations, P21, growth factor receptor mutations, EGF, TGF, HER2 mu, VGF, and various kinds of apoptotic regulators. So there is a certain degree of familial uh, pattern to esophagus cancer as well. Now, in terms of diagnosis, um, I hope the screen is not getting here. Yeah. In terms of diagnosis, if the patient showed up in the office with dysphagia, it typically means he's late, he or she is late. Uh, it typically means the tumor is already pretty advanced. Um, it, has, it has kind of gone through the layers of the esophagus and you're dealing with a much different disease. However, because reflux is becoming so common now, we tend to scope a lot of people and we pick up Barrett's frequently. Once patient gets Barrett, they get frequent endoscopies. If they get high grade dysplasia, they get RFA or EMR and they're getting all kinds of endoscopic procedures done, thus allowing us to pick up esophagus cancer early. It's still not to a point where uh, patients should regularly be screened, but uh, because there is such high prevalence of endoscopy, we are seeing more and more early stage uh, esophagus cancer. I also feel that because we are doing more and more bariatric surgery now, we are picking up esophagus cancer <laughs> in its early stages. So most of the patients that show up um, with this early stage esophagus cancers have no symptoms. They have been picked up accidentally while getting a biopsy for either Barrett's or getting a biopsy uh, during a workup for bariatric procedures. But if the patient showed up with dysphagia, that typically indicates the disease is advanced. Um, some of the tests we would do are barium swallow, endoscopy, EUS, CT, bronchoscopy, and PET. And I'll go over each of these in a little bit more detail. Barium swallow. Um, while it was routine to get a barium swallow on everybody, and we still would, uh, if suppose somebody's getting an endoscopy, I'm not necessarily sure a barium swallow helps. Um, secondly, I think one's got to be very careful doing a barium swallow if the tumor is so big and patients have severe dysphagia because they could aspirate. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little reticent to uh, order a barium swallow on everybody. Suppose somebody has dysphagia and endoscopies has already biopsied it, I might avoid a barium swallow. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the biopsy indicates that the tumor is in the mid thoracic esophagus, so roughly about, say, 25 centimeters from the teeth. That's where the carina exists. I would be worried about that sort of tumor eroding into the airway, so I would, in that patient, also get a bronchoscopy. Uh, EUS, endoscopic ultrasound. Endoscopic ultrasound has become pretty much the mainstay of staging procedure nowadays for esophagus cancer but there are, um, there are some subtleties to how to use the data. For one, it's not, it's not uh, a definitive thing in, in terms of staging. There are subtleties to how we interpret EUS data, uh, and, and I'll come to that in a minute. And then the role for CT and a PET. Typically, patients will get a CT scan first. 
but I think a PET CT is better than a CT because uh, it shows the tumor. It shows, it's likely to show the lymph nodes associated with it. It's a full body scan. Um, the only problem with a PET CT scan is you can't tell whether somebody has got liver mets. In that sort of scenario, one would get a CT and then get an ultrasound and then biopsy if necessary. But a PET scan can be a little unreliable when it comes to looking for liver mets. So let's go to the, the modality that's pretty much standard now, uh, which is the EUS, the endoscopic ultrasound. And this, this is a picture of how an endoscopic ultrasound looks. You see these different colors here, the bright versus the light. And the light, each of these represent different layers of the esophagus. So the first layer is the epithelium and the basement membrane. That would be the, the light layer and the darker layer. And then you have the muscularis, muscularis mucosa. Uh, the submucosa, the muscularis propria, and the periesophageal tissue. As you can tell, um, this thing can be a little unreliable when the colors are not clearly identifiable. And so if you're trying to differentiate between T1 and T2, and you don't exactly have a clear demarcation there, bright versus light, and sometimes that can be confusing in, in deciding the stage. So uh, this is a, a tumor which is T3. It's involving the muscular layer, the muscularis propria. So EUS is about 60 to 70 percent accurate when it's when you're trying to find the T stage. T stage meaning how deep it has gone through the esophagus. It is about 70 percent, 75 percent accurate when it comes to picking up nodes. Um, EUS is almost like EBUS when it comes to picking up mediastinal nodes. Um, Nodes have to be big, they have to be discrete, they have to be biopsible. Uh, that might not always be possible. And so, as you can see, it has it is a good test, but it is not uh, absolutely reliable. T stage can be confusing, especially early stages. And the end stage can be confusing too, especially if the lymph nodes are further away and the scope cannot come in contact with the node when they're doing the ultrasound. PET CT scan. Uh, well, the PET CT scan is now the gold standard. So add it together, the EUS and the PET scan, when you put it together, I think really helps, really helps. Because uh, um, although the T stage can be limited with the PET because T stage, and I'll come to that again in a second, but different stages for esophagus scan. So the T stage depends on how deep it has gone. Obviously on a PET scan, it's hard to tell how deep the tumor has gone. So it's difficult to tell the T stage on a PET scan. But the PET scan is very good in identifying metastatic disease. And it is better than CT scan when it comes to picking up metastatic disease. This is a patient of mine who had a mid thoracic um, esophagus cancer. You can see there's a disease there just above the carina uh, involving the esophagus. The point I wanted to make when I showed this picture was it's hard to tell, as you can see the image, of when the tumor ends and a lymph node starts. So the lymph node, if it is very close to the tumor, both of these appear like one entity and it's difficult to differentiate one versus another. Not that it matters in the long term because you'll see how we manage these kind of patients. They both get the same kind of treatment, but I would say when suppose somebody has lymph nodes versus no lymph nodes, it does indicate a worse prognosis. So CT, PET imaging, um, primary tumor get picked up more than 95%. The sensitivity and the specificity for nodes is 51 and 84. What that means is it's very good at saying nodes are not there versus nodes are there because the specificity is 84%. Same thing for METs. It's a very good at saying METs are not present versus METs are present uh, and has an accuracy of 82% for stage four disease. Now let's go uh, to the TNM staging of esophagus cancer. And, and while it can get confusing, T1, T2, T3, T4, in real practice, what it comes down to is, is it stage one versus everything else? Stage four we know is never gonna get surgery. But if it is stage one, these patients get surgery right away without new adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation versus anything more than stage one gets new adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. So while it can get confusing in trying to remember these things, what it comes down to is the leftmost portion of the slide here. So this is the epithelium, the basement membrane, the lamina propria. And if you look to your left, that's a lymph node there and the lymphatics go up 
to the lamina propria. Now, why is that important? If the tumor is restricted to being in the epithelium or the base one membrane, like a high grade dysplasia or an early stage T1 lesion, it has not yet gone to the lymphatics. So there is no chance that the lymphatics would be involved. That's the kind of tumor that can be amenable to an endoscopic dissection. They do EMR or RFA and do everything endoscopically. You don't have to do surgery at all. However, the endoscopist cannot tell you how deep it is and says, you know what, in some of those, some of those slides, I actually see the lamin appropriate involvement or the muscularis mucosae involvement. That means you can't be sure that a tumor involved the lymphatic. That patient should get an esophagectomy. Very, very important concept. And this sort of brings us, brings us to the cusp of uh, surgeons versus endoscopists, right? Uh, they always, there's all these new technologies out there, RFA, EMR, cryo, all kinds of stuff in the industry is sort of rampant, you know, sort of this proliferation of newer technologies that try to, try to um, um, uh, deal with these early stage esophagus cancers. But the, the, the concept is, <laughs> if the tumor has gone past the lamina propria, there is no way to tell if the lymphatic is involved or not. And that patient should get an esophagectomy. In terms of the TNM staging, T1, as you can see here, um, involvement of the mucosa, that's the epithelium, basement membrane, lamina propria, muscularis mucosae. T2, the tumor goes further down, goes up to the muscularis propria. T3, it goes past the muscularis propria. As you know, the esophagus does not have a serosa. So it now goes through the three layers of the esophagus into the fat surrounding the esophagus, that's T3 and T4 is involvement of the surrounding structures. In real life, in practice, what really matters to us is how superficial it is. T2, T3, T4, they would all be treated in a similar way. And you wanna know how many lymph nodes are involved, or whether the distant nodes are involved, because that kind of gives you a sense of prognosis. That doesn't mean patient's not gonna get an operation, it just gives you a sense of prognosis. EUS is a very good test at picking up lymph nodes, uh, but the lymph node has to be close to where the scope is. There could be lymph nodes further out that the scope cannot identify. And maybe a PET could uh, kind of contribute in that, uh, to, that to those kind of uh, scenarios. <clears throat> Histologic grade matters, well differentiated versus moderate, poorly and undifferentiated, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second. In terms of lymph node staging, Esophagus is a very unique organ. It starts in the neck, spends a lot of time in the chest, and lands up in the abdomen. So the lymph node involvement could be involving all the three body cavities, literally. So you can have cervical lymph node involvement if it's up a third. You can have involvement, um, uh, mediastinal involvement, so station seven, station eight, station four, uh, even station two. Uh, and if it and, and involvement of the distal esophagus could be celiac nodes, peripancreatic nodes, retroperitoneal nodes. So because it is, uh, it is uh, such a large organ across three different parts of the body, the lymph node involvement can be very unreliable. There's also a lot of cross connection that happens and you can end up with skip metastasis. And that is one reason why some people would advocate for extended lymphadenectomy when they do an esophagectomy although that's becoming increasingly less common. Because the lymphatics tend to have this, um, they tend to uh, sort of arborize, um, you can land up with lymphatic involvements across the, across so you could very, very rarely have a G junction tumor, say, involving a, a, a cervical node. That would be very unlikely, but it's possible. And one has to be uh, cognizant of that fact. <clears throat> If the patient had, say, uh, upper one-third esophagus cancer and had an associated celiac node, although it all falls within the realm of esophageal nodal disease, that's the kind of patient who would technically be considered as M1. The patient had a G junction cancer and had a supraclavicular node. That's the kind of patient that would be treated as M1 because to surgically treat that disease would involve total esophagectomy, radical neck dissection, um, and, and, a, and a probably a three-hole esophagectomy, and 
probably the outcomes are not going to be very good. So when a lymph node falls outside the realm of what that area of the esophagus is, we would typically treat that as M1 disease, in addition to, of course, distant mats like in the liver. Survival. Stage one, these numbers are old, as you can see, it's from 2006. We have gotten better at this because we're picking up cancers earlier and earlier. Stage one, I quote about 80 to 85%. I think it's probably higher than that. Stage two, 50%. I think it also depends on the, the histological type of cancer and the biology of the disease. Stage three is probably one of the commonest stages that we see these patients at. It's only 14%. Uh, and stage four, of course, nobody survives five years if they have stage four esophagus cancer. I would take these numbers with a little grain of salt because these are old numbers. These are already 14 years old. In terms of staging, uh, stage one is typically T1 and T2 with a good biology. So um, well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, T2, we would still call that stage one. Um, and then bullet differentiated adenocarcinoma if it's T2 would be stage two. And of course, as you can see, anything beyond that, T2, T3 would be T2 and above. Approach to therapy. <clears throat> Surgery is about removal of the disease, thus local control. Radiation, again, local control. In general, whether we do surgery or whether you do radiation, you're either, either trying to take this thing completely out or you're trying to suppress the tumor so you can live longer. Or in the third case, which is increasingly uncommon, is you'll give radiation in a palliative way so that the patient can eat because nowadays you have stents and all kinds of different things. Adjuvant therapy, that's when you're giving chemotherapy, you're eliminating occult local disease and you're eliminating occult systemic disease. And these concepts are important, and I'll come to that in a second. Before we talk about locally advanced esophagus cancer, that's anything T2 and above, let's talk a little bit about management of early esophagus cancer. So as I said earlier, early esophagus cancer is in situ intramucosal cancers or T1A, T1B. T1A is involvement of lamina propria or the muscularis mucosae. And as you know, lamina propria is where all the lymphatics come in. Lymphatics yeah. mean presence of potential lymph nodes, changes the survival. T1B is involvement of submucosa. Involvement of submucosa is a little different compared to T1A because T1A could be all managed endoscopically. And T1B would require esophagectomy, but no need for chemotherapy and radiation. And then of course, uh, early stage esophagus cancer means there is no evidence of any nodal disease and distant mass. That can be identified using an EUS. All of this applies to an adenocarcinoma. It does not apply to a squamous cell carcinoma. Important concept. Again, going back to the earlier diagram, T1A would be involvement of the epithelium basement membrane. T1B would be involvement of lamina propria and the muscularis mucosae. Um, I'm sorry, uh, um, T1A would be involvement with the epithelial basement membrane and T1B would be lamina uh, muscularis mucosae and once it goes into the submucosa, it becomes T2. This entire realm of early stage esophagus cancer plays into reflux disease and Barrett's because patients have reflux, then they get identified with Barrett's. Barrett's not cancer yet, it's just metaplasia. You have squamous cell, uh, same cells, they have switched to an intestinal, intestinal mucosa-like like appearance. This Barrett's then becomes high-grade dysplasia. You start seeing atypical cells. And high-grade dysplasia then starts touching the boundary of intramucosal cancer and T1A, T1B lesions. So if patient has T1A or T1B lesion, you would do an EMR. Once you do an EMR, the pathologist that's actually can be tricky sometimes because they got to strip the entire mucosa like a banana peel of the entire pathology in a, in a sort of a circumferential fashion. And then the pathologist will make multiple sites. I actually think of that like most surgery for skin. They'll do make multiple slides. And if they find that cancer has gone further down, that becomes T2. 
So EMR becomes not just a therapeutic modality, it also becomes a diagnostic modality. It's all endoscopic, so it's an excellent thing. So I look at EMR as not just treatment of early stage esophagus cancer, it's also diagnosis of early stage esophagus cancer because if they did an EMR on somebody with high grade dysplasia or stage one, or stage one A or B, and then they came back to me and said, the cancer has gone further down, that patient should get an esophagectomy. And as you can see in this, this diagram here, you get Barrett's, you do an EUS, you figure it out if it's T1A or T1B, do an EMR, there's a negative margin, you're done, you can, you, you can stick with the EMR, maybe you can repeat an EMR down the road, just do surveillance, and if there's a positive margin, they'll be sent to us for an esophagectomy. The patient has T2 disease on the other hand, where the tumor has already gone into the submucosa, there is no role for any endoscopic approach. That patient gets an esophagectomy. Uh, this is how we do an EMR. Uh, pretty standard now. There's like a there's different devices available. The principle of which is mm. a, little, a little suction like device, and you suck the mucosa in, and then you instill saline underneath, create a kind of a flap. Very similar to a POEM technique, which I, I presume uh, another surgeon is going to talk about tomorrow. In the POEM technique, you create this tunnel underneath the mucosa until you get to the muscle and then you do a myotomy similar to that. So you kind of instill something underneath and create a flap all around and strip the whole, whole uh, mucosa out, as you can see uh, on the picture in the bottom right. That's how it looks. So this is a nodular sort of appearance to high-grade dysplasia, and this is what it would look like. <clears throat> they're pushing the boundaries of what can be done via EMR. So typically one would have said, you've got to do an EMR if the lesion is less than two centimeters. But nowadays they'll end up resecting even seven, eight centimeters worth of mucosa sometimes. And then they'll send it to pathologists to look at closely. This data is old, it's from 2009. It's the University of Pittsburgh data for T1 cancers, that's T1A, T1B, managed by an endoscopic approach. Um, and um, um, I, I apologize uh, if I digress here. This is, uh, this is T1 lesions managed by esophagectomy. And uh, they propose a disease-free survival with simple probability uh, of about um, 60 to 70% five years and beyond. Of course, technology has changed and nowadays we are doing things endoscopically and this is old information, but Concerning T1 disease, this is the best information I could find in the surgeon's world. <clears throat> that brings me to how most esophagus cancers are managed in the United States. Almost every patient that I see, and I saw this week, I saw two patients. Um, they come with disease that's T3 and above. So I'll give you an example. This particular patient I'm referring to is, uh, is about 57 years old, white man. Um, uh, he works with a construction worker and he presented with dysphagia. He goes to the endoscopist. Uh, and he had lost about 30 pounds because he can't eat solid food. And they put a scope in and they can barely get the adult scope past that mass. They biopsy it, it's an adenocarcinoma. It extends in the distal, it starts at 35 centimeters from the teeth and extends to about 40 centimeters. So distal esophageal mass. EUS scope is bigger than a regular scope. So sometimes it's difficult to do an EUS. In this particular instance, they could barely get a regular scope in there. So getting an EUS scope was not possible. So then that's how the patient gets sent over. Next thing we do is a PET scan, we rule out distant metastatic disease. And then we group that as either a T3 or a T4 lesion. There's no way to tell because short of an EUS, you can't tell how deep it's gone but you know for sure that it's not stage one and you know for sure it's not stage two because it's this large friable mass, it's a conferential. So it's T3 and above. And then you get a sense of how many lymph nodes the patient has. And this particular patient had two or three lymph nodes within about three to four centimeters of the mass. So it would, in my mind, based on just the PET scan, it would be a T3 and one disease. This is a pretty common way in which these presentations present. And so how do you manage that? Our management, at least in the United States, 
for locally advanced esophagus cancer, like the one I described, is pretty much based on this landmark study done called known as the CROSS study. Um, and um, CROSS study is a trial that was done in the Netherlands. And this, by multiple papers that came out of it, initially New England Journal in 2012, and then they waited three more years for more data to come in. And this is the one that came out in Lancet in 2015 based on the same data set. And it talked about the effect of preoperative concurrent chemo radiation on survival of patients with resectable esophageal or esophageal gastric junction cancers. So uh, CROSS stands for concurrent chemo radiation, that's CR, esophageal and esophageal gastric, resectable esophageal and esophageal gastric junction study, CROSS trial. Uh, it's based out of the Netherlands. The inclusion criteria for these for this particular trial was esophagus cancer immaterial whether it's squamous cell versus an adenocarcinoma with good function, uh, uh, no problems with the kidneys and liver and uh, all that stuff. It had to be either a T1N1, as you know, T1 would have been considered early stage, but T1N1 would have been a higher stage. T2 and above with no meds. The major exclusion would be, as I talked earlier, early stage cancers that would be T1. The tumor is very long, like eight centimeter mass, that would be a long mass, and the patient has lost a lot of weight. This kind of seems odd to me because most of the times patients come with, with significant weight loss, but let, we'll just ignore that for the moment. So uh, these patients were categorized, they were grouped into two categories. Uh, one was surgery alone, versus the another, which received a combination of carboplatin paclitaxel with, uh, with uh, 41 gray of radiation. Uh, in the United States, this, they modify the amount of radiation they get. In Europe, they get 41. Here, we get, they get about 45 gray. And then after that's completed in 23 days, you wait five weeks, you repeat a PET scan to make sure the patient has not developed any metastatic disease. Uh, and then perform uh, and then perform surgery versus patients that got surgery alone without uh, preoperative chemotherapy and radiation. So <clears throat> in terms of the postoperative morbidity and mortality, uh, obviously patients with who got chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, they uh, they had a slightly higher rate of pneumonia. The cardiac complications were more or less similar. Chylothorax was a little higher because the pleura tends to thicken and then it's easy to injure the thoracic duct. Um, anastomotic leakage was slightly higher because of radiated tissue and in-house mortality was kind of similar. But most importantly, the Parish, overall uh, survival- Parish, sorry yes. to stop you for one second, sorry. Just a housekeeping thing. Uh, everybody who is live on the meeting you're sharing your screen, okay? We are all, your screens are live with us. Do yes. not write on your screen. Otherwise, okay. we get these marks. This is for all the participants. This is not for you, Paresh. It's for all the participants. Whoever has just scribbled on the screen, please take away this mark. Otherwise, we, we cannot continue. This is really a problem for all the participants. Please do not scribble on your screen. Paresh, could you just... Uh, uh, stop sharing and reshare because this mark will not go and it will continue for the rest of the talk. Sorry about that, Paresh. I apologize. Hold on. Just stop sharing and then reshare again. I, I am really sorry about this, Paresh. I apologize sincerely. So stop share and then reshare. Oh, this got disabled again. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the hand. I'll give you the hand. Sorry about that, Paresh. It, it's just uh, because we are recording, it becomes so difficult. Uh, I've made you the host, Paresh, so you could take over and start sharing. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, please. I'm sorry about that, Paresh. Apologies, please. 
on yes. behalf of the participants apologies uh, all right. i hope i hope you can all hear me yeah. um, we're, we're good so, so going back to cross trial just to uh, there was a brief interruption there so what i was trying to say was the standard of care in the united states now in the western world for the management of locally advanced esophagus cancer is neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation chemotherapies some cisplatinum based chemotherapy radiation anywhere between 41 to 45 centigrade and then followed by when that's completed followed by 5 weeks later we repeat a pet scan and then they get surgery um and with that if you look at this this uh, this curves over here uh the green one is the one that got preoperative chemotherapy radiation followed by surgery versus the blue one is the one that surgery alone and the overall median survival of patients who got neoadjuvant therapy was about 48 months versus the other which was 24 months that's amazing because now suddenly we have a median survival of 4 years uh by giving preoperative chemotherapy and radiation prior to surgery now this stuff is easier said than than done because there are many nuances to this one it assumes the fact that it doesn't matter whether the patient has adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma which i think is unfair i think squamous cell carcinomas respond very well to radiation i think squamous cell carcinomas tend to happen in patients who are sicker thinner uh, malnourished sometimes they are bad candidates for surgery adenocarcinomas tend to happen in obese patients so fundamentally these are two different kinds of patients that are being grouped together but this is the best we have in terms of the the, the standard approach i think the, you know everyone needs to tailor their approach based on the circumstance but it would be considered the standard of care for patients to get chemotherapy and radiation followed by surgery when it comes to locally advanced um locally advanced uh, uh it's after this cancer <clears throat> now uh a, a few salient review points here there is no evidence to support post operative chemo alone or pre operative radiotherapy alone for this after this cancer all right as i mentioned pre operative chemo radiation is a standard of care for locally advanced disease with a 20% reduction of risk of death uh chemo radiation if done properly in good biology patients results in complete pathologic response in about 30 to 40% of the patients and this may or may not be seen on a pet scan um sometimes it's seen on a pet scan and then we all feel happy about it but if i if i had a patient of locally advanced cancer and i did preoperative chemotherapy and radiation and then i repeated a pet scan and i found that the disease was still active i would still operate on that case the only reason for me not to do surgery would be the patient had some distant metastatic disease while the patient was being treated and that happens in roughly about 8% of the cases okay now going to what we like to do that what we are here to talk about is esophagectomy uh and esophagectomy uh is the most effective way of local disease control there's many ways to do an esophagectomy and increasingly there is a push to do things minimally invasively we'll come to that in a second the is the impact of esophagectomy tends to be controversial in some instances especially in malnourished patients patients with large squamous cell carcinomas one has to wonder if you really want to subject those sickly patients to an esophagectomy or whether they should get radiation alone so i would say the impact can be sometimes controversial um uh, esophagus is a unique organ as i mentioned earlier it does not have a serosa the strength comes from the mucosa and not from the serosa it has a proximity to different structures in the neck in the chest and the abdomen so it's kind of one of the strange organs that kind of traverses through different parts of the body and having a good sense of the anatomy is extremely important to me if i'm doing a three hole esophagectomy that is involved in the neck and the chest and the abdomen i think of things very differently for instance in the neck my concern is a recurrent laryngeal nerve in the chest i want to make sure i don't hurt the membranous portion of the trachea in the abdomen i want to make sure i am very particular about preserving the spleen and making sure the right gastroepiploid artery is not injured so 
since the organ goes through different parts of the body, getting having a good sense of the anatomy of the different parts of the body becomes so important. The lymphatic spread can be bidirectional, as I said. There's a lot of arborization of these lymphatics. And while they follow set patterns, for instance, mid-thoracic esophagus, one would expect mediastinal nodes, lower thoracic esophagus, one would expect celiac nodes. Sometimes you can have distant mets in a, in, in a sort of a very uh, strange fashion. For instance, you have a G junction tumor without any nodal disease close by and a cervical met. That kind of creates a unique scenario. One would say that's metastatic disease and treat the patient with definitive chemotherapy or radiation. However, the patient has good functional status and that's the only disease that patient has. That might be one instance to do a three-hole esophagectomy and a radical neck dissection. So it depends on, on the circumstance. And then the controversies associated with the GE junction. Because we kind of, think of esophagus and stomach as separate organs, um, it tends to be, you know, oh, well, thoracic surgeon will take care of the esophagus and stomach will be taken care of by the surgical oncologist. Uh, that becomes one of those gray zones where sometimes we end up doing a total gastrectomy in addition to an esophagectomy, or you'll do a total esophagectomy with just a partial gastrectomy, depending on which, which what, sort of, what is our training, what is our jet and and you know, how we've been brought up. Um, and so there are some controversies associated with the GE junction tumors. I'll come to that in a second. So once again, um, uh, the neck. So in the neck, you're worried about um, vasculature in the neck. And for me in particular, uh, I'm always worried about the recurrent meningeal nerve. In the chest, I'm worried about the membranous portion of the trachea. And in the abdomen, um, uh, I'm worried about the, the, the gastroepiploid vessels. Lymphatic spread, as I mentioned, um, upper one third cervical area, middle third mediastinum, uh, lower third celiac. Different esophageal resection techniques. So classically, most people on the planet are either going to do an Ivo Lewis or a trans hiatal. Uh, increasingly, people will do a minimally invasive esophagectomy, or if you have access to a robot, and if you have enough experience with a robot, you will do a robotic assisted esophagectomy. This is essentially a laparoscopic esophagectomy done with a robot. The complications of esophagectomy are egregious. One, would, one should achieve to have a zero leak rate in esophagectomy because when these things leak, the leak in the chest or the leak in the neck and then the patient can't eat and they are long-term feeding with the, with, the, with the J-tube. Already, the five-year survival is pretty low. As I said, the stage three five-year survival is like 14, 15%. In a scenario like that, for them to have morbidity is a terrible thing. And so no matter what you choose to do, the, the goal has to always be to not have a leak or anything that causes increasing morbidity or worst of which is the leak. The reason why I say that is invariably all these patients are radiating. They all have had chemotherapy and they all have lost weight. You got to be doing about 20 to 25 of these a year, at least to maintain a certain degree of expertise to deliver a good quality operation. Um, literature says eight operations a year. I think you got to be doing 20 to 25. Um, if you have 20 to 25 esophagectomies coming your way, and then you start to do them laparoscopic and you replicate the operation about two times a month in a fairly organized and routine fashion, you're going to get there where you can provide a good quality operation, laparoscopic or robotic. My point is, pick one of these, doesn't matter which one you do, but make sure the patient doesn't have a complication. Most commonly, if you were to do it open, and I'll talk a little bit about the MRE piece later. If you want to do it open, you fall in the category of either doing an Ivan Lewis or a trans hiatal. And there is a raging controversy about this, which is a better operation. And Ivan Lewis, as you know, you open the chest and you open the chest, the higher chance of pneumonia, it hurts more. Trans hiatal, you're doing only the neck and the abdomen. So it's kind of a less morbid operation. Then again, if you're opening the chest, you can do a good lymph node dissection. Whereas if you're doing it trans 
it's a blind procedure, so you're not really picking on lymph nodes adequately. If you're doing a GE junction tumor, um, trying to take out the entire esophagus and do an anastomosis in the neck when the problem is at the GE junction seems a little unfair. So there are subtleties to this, uh, but there's little data supporting one approach versus another. And it all comes down to your training and which operation you can deliver the best. The reality is most of us are gonna see something that looks like this. This is a GE junction lesion. It's a large lesion. You can see it's a big bulky mass. I would call this at least a P3 or P4 lesion. Uh, the principal considerations, of course, the primary considerations, of course, are negative margins, both proximal and distal, being comfortable with an approach you use. Uh, and of course, the choice of the procedure is impacted by the location of the tumor, the stage of the tumor, um, and, and, and how morbid the operation can be. Why, the reason why I say that is, if you had a cancer, say in the mid thoracic esophagus, roughly about 25 to 30 centimeters from the teeth, that operation, you might have to do an Ivor Lewis on that, because if you did it transhiatally, you're kind of risking injury to the airway. You'll have to do an Ivor Lewis. Um, but if you're aiming to achieve three, four centimeters margin proximal to that, your anastomosis is going to be very high in the neck, and you could end up jeopardizing the right recurrent meningeal nerve. So in a scenario like that, you might want to do a three-hole or a McCoon esophagectomy, where you start off in the chest first, you dissect the tumor, then you go in the abdomen, create a stomach tube, then you go in the neck and do the anastomosis in the neck. That way you're taking care of uh, adequate margins, there's no tension. So depending on the location of your tumor, you'll have to tailor the kind of esophagectomy you're doing. Most of us came from one of these training programs that did one more versus another. I trained at the Mass General and we did a lot of thoracoabdominal esophagectomies at Ivan Lewis. I also had an opportunity to spend time at the Sloan Kettering for three months and Mayo Clinic where they did a lot of trans and Ivan Lewis work. So typically one would do either an Ivan Lewis or a trans uh, and certain places they'll do more of a thoracoabdominal. What I haven't included in there is a minimally invasive esophagectomy, which the University of Pittsburgh kind of popularized, I would say somewhere after 2010. And now it's kind of increasingly becoming a common technique. Um, some of them are replicating an Ivor Lewis laparoscopically. Uh, some of them are replicating a three-hole procedure laparoscopically. Some of them in, in India, Dr. Palanivelu does a, uh, esophagectomy in a prone technique, something that I have never seen here, uh, simply because I think proning large people might be difficult in the United States. Uh, but um, uh, you know, he, he, he has fantastic results with a prone esophagectomy and I've had the opportunity to watch a bunch of his videos, although I've never done one of those. The location of the tumor, proximity of the tumor to the airway is important. Uh, if you had a tumor, as I mentioned earlier, close to the airway near the carina, you have to do a thoracotomy because you've got to be careful and peel the tumor away from the, from the, from the airway because uh, if you blindly do a transhiatal, you could have your finger going to the airway and that's a disaster. Uh, so proximity to an airway mandates presence of a thoracotomy. Um, and of course, the ex proximal extent of the disease, as I mentioned earlier, the disease is very high up in the, in the chest you'll have to do a three-hole esophagectomy. Sometimes squamous cell carcinomas tend to be multi multifocal, or you could have one adenocarcinoma and one squamous cell carcinoma, and that would mandate the need for a total esophagectomy, which would be a three-hole esophagectomy. Uh, the likelihood of lymph node involvement also impacts the selection of the procedure. Um, larger tumors are more likely to involve more nodes, as one would expect, so T3 is more likely to have N1 or N2 disease. Uh, the, the morbidity is higher in the presence of a thoracotomy. As you can see, pneumonia is higher in the presence of a thoracotomy. I'm not necessarily certain that uh, presence of a thoracotomy increases the leak rate. And the percentage of death that you see in that data there is increasingly uncommon. I think the mortality nowadays from a thoracotomy uh, for an esophagectomy is less than 2%. But you know, these are numbers that I've picked up from older papers. Um, other surgical morbidities associated with esophagectomy, delayed gastric emptying, 
invariably they all end up with a truncal vagotomy. And then you got to do some sort of a pyloric drainage, drainage procedure, either a pyloromyotomy or a pyloplasty. You can have delayed gastric emptying because of edema of the pylorus. Sometimes the gastric conduit can kink, causing delayed emptying, or you can have a patchless conduit, thus creating a sort of a pseudo shelf and delayed emptying. Uh, and of course, feeding tube problems. Invariably, every esoph esophagectomy patient ends up with reflux. I tell all my patients to sleep, out, sleep in a recumbent position because all those defense mechanisms that you had to prevent reflux are gone once you, once you do an esophagectomy. You essentially uh, created a situation where the stomach's now sitting in the chest, so they all have reflux. That is to be expected, and they'll be on lifelong PPIs or proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. So the principles of an esophagectomy. Uh, esophagectomy means removing of the esophagus. If you remove the esophagus, you have to create a new conduit. The most common conduit that we use is the stomach. So you're making a tube out of the stomach. The blood vessel on which this entire tube is based is the right gastroepiploid artery. The right gastroepiploid artery, as you can see in the diagram down there, is, is a branch of the gastroduodenal artery. So if you look at this picture here, it's based out of this artery. And everything else is cut off, right? So the left gastric is taken down. You would not bother uh, hurting the right gastric because there is no need, and you will take the short gastrics. So the stomach tube, when it's made, is dependent on this vessel. It's the right gastroepiploid artery. The other options to create a conduit are colon, if you don't have stomach for whatever reason, one example would be say somebody had a, a gastric bypass procedure or just does not have enough stomach available to create a large enough conduit. In that case, we'll use a colon. We can either use a right colon or the left colon. The better choice is the left colon. The left colon is based off the ascending branch or the left colic artery. You can even use small bowel. There's free flaps that are, people are talking about. They use a jejunal free flap and then they do this microvascular anastomosis, I have never seen it or participated in any of that. Typically for most of our needs, you'll end up using the stomach in 95% of the times, and maybe once or twice a year, you'll end up using the colon. The principles, as we continue here, um, you'll, you'll ligate the omental branches, maintain the right gastroepiploid. You'll kind of, uh, keep about three to four centimeter margin distal to the G junction, create a stomach tube. There's a controversy as to how thick this tube has to be. I use four finger breaths. I've got big fingers. Some people will use three finger breaths, roughly anywhere between four to six centimeters diameter tube, um, all based off the right gastroepiploic. And then you'll bring that into the chest. Um, I kind of kept pictures open versus laparoscopic. Here it's the open technique. You would do a lymphadenectomy. The typical nodes you'll be looking for would be at the origin of the celiac artery. Uh, and you will get that when you lift the stomach up and as, as you're going across the left gastric with the stapler, you want to take all the lymph nodes that you, you want to take out with your specimen and then, and then ligate the vessel distal to the lymph nodes on the left gastric. Presence of a feeding tube, I think it's necessary. Uh, there are some centers where they'll feed the patients purely on TPN, but I think feeding tubes are a good thing. Uh, I put a J-tube in all my patients. Gastric drainage procedure, as I mentioned earlier, there's still a sort of controversy about whether or not you need to do it. Uh, at the Mass General, nobody did a gastric drainage procedure. Um, in Pittsburgh, everybody got a gastric drainage procedure. So my personal practice is I either do a pyromyotomy, where you cut only the muscle, leave the mucosa intact. It's difficult to do at times, and you'll end up inadvertently getting into the stomach. If that's the case, you do a pyroplasty. You do a you 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 vertically incise in the stomach, extending past the pylorus, and then you horizontally sew it with about three or four uh, three or silk sutures. I usually put a mental patch on top. It almost never leaks. Ivan Lewis, um, two parts. First, you'll do the abdominal portion of it, the laparotomy, and then you'll flip the patient over and do a thoracotomy, typically the fifth or sixth space, depending on how high, 
how high the tumor is. Uh, and you want to do the anastomosis as high as possible. I would typically go above the azimuth vein. Uh, this is how typically a specimen would look like. This is the mobilized esophagus. This is the main stem bronchus, um, right main stem, the left main stem, pericardium. You want to get all the lymph nodes with the specimen. A transhiatal procedure is a blunt procedure. Uh, you'll finish the belly portion of the operation, uh, and then you'll put a, you'll put your hand in a retrocardiac fashion after making a little opening into the diaphragm. Um, I, I usually take a a black load stapler and open up the diaphragm a little bit so I can get my hand in there. All the vessels that come off the esophagus, I'll take using some sort of an energy device. I'll make an incision in the neck. My personal preference is to go from the mastoid towards the towards the clavicular head, uh, a straight line. Um, my partner prefers to do um, a, a, a thyroid-like incision. Do not use cartilage up in the neck. Uh, so put a penrose around the esophagus in the neck and then bluntly dissect in the periesophageal fashion between the neck and the abdomen. And then the anastomosis is done in the neck. Um, the transhyal esophagectomy, as you know, is, a, is the University of Michigan thing. Dr. Oringer popularized this technique and he swears by it. They've had some pretty large numbers there. I find it pretty strange the mortality was 3%. Uh, I, 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 that's something that's uh, very, very unlikely in 2020. The mortality is almost zero, but I would say can never be zero, less than 1%. Five year survival was about 29%. There is not much difference between the trans thoracic versus the trans hiatal approach, other than the fact that trans thoracic approach involves a thoracotomy and has a higher percentage of pneumonias. Uh, pulmonary complications are higher. A thoracic abdominal esophagectomy involves is a classic operation that I would do for a G junction tumor because it involves one incision. Uh, I would also use a, a similar approach for failed hiatal hernias for benign reasons sometimes. Patients have had multiple hiatal hernia repairs three, four times laparoscopic, doesn't work. So then we'll end up doing a, a, a G junction resection through this kind of an approach. Um, typically, we would go through the sixth space and extend the incision in a posterolateral thoracotomy-like fashion, bringing it across the arch, costal arch, onto the abdomen. So it's like a laparotomy as well as a thoracotomy. You would, uh, you, you would cut the, the diaphragm close to the chest wall, not through the middle, because the phrenic nerve is likely to be injured. You want to you close it closer to the chest wall between silk sutures. Uh, and that way, you get a wonderful access to the chest as well as abdomen especially if your resection area is involved in just the GE junction. This is a one incision thing. Uh, it's about, about a four to four, three and a half, four hour operation. Uh, I find that to be very convenient for a GE junction. An astomotic technique. So initially people hand sewed GE junction, um, sorry, uh, and neck anastomosis, hand sewed, sweet, popularized the hand sewed technique in the abdomen. But now with the advent of staplers, my personal preference is to use an EEA stapler. Um, so if you look at the diagram to the left, is you put the anvil in the in the, in the proximal portion, uh, you get this purse finger device that you can use to go across the esophagus. I take another layer of <coughs> two of proline to further buttress the muscle layer on top. Then I do a gastrotomy and get the proximal portion of the stapler, uh, and then mate the anvil to that, uh, and then fire the stapler and now you have a gastrotomy that you can close with another firing of an endo GIA. Uh, this is a technique that Oringer uses for the uh, neck anastomosis. The, so that's the esophagus, that's the stomach. The distal portion uh, involves an endo GIA, that's anastomosis uh, with a stapler, and then the proximal portion involves either a continuous or intermittent um, uh, suture using uh, 2 or 3 or micro. Uh, importance of radial margins, yes. R0 resections, higher chance of survival, obviously. Um, so um, it's very important to do frozen sections in the operating room. That's what we would typically do. Does radiation replace more radical surgery? No. Uh, I think what chemo radiation does is it allows you to have, have a better R0 resection. Um, thus, by R0 meaning no more tumor left behind, 
So radiation allows you to uh, get better margins, it shrinks the tumor. And so radiation augments surgery, it's not a replacement for surgery. More extensive lymphadenectomy, well, a higher, a more extensive lymphadenectomy indicates, uh, you know, uh, you've done better surgery, you've made an attempt to get more lymph nodes. And so a uh, more extensive lymphadenectomy in, invariably uh, is gonna show a, a better survival. Although I would say that uh, nowadays with the advent of minimal invasive esophagectomy, I think that's getting becoming harder and harder to do because um, unlike the past where we would sort of go digging for lymph nodes in both the chest and the abdominal cavity, when you do it laparoscopically or, or rats approach, this tends to be harder to achieve. That's my personal experience, but um, more extensive lymphadenectomy sort of um, gets you a better stage, allows you to do better adjuvant therapy, and hence more extensive lymphadenectomy is associated with better survival. Now coming to G junction tumors. G junction tumors are a separate entity in itself because it could be more esophagus, less stomach, or it could be more stomach, less, less esophagus. And uh, one way to classify G junction tumors is the C word classification. So if you look at the diagram on the left, C word one is um, one centimeter above the G junction, up to four centimeters going on to the esophagus. C word three is two centimeters past the G junction and three centimeters into the stomach. And C word one is one centimeter above and two centimeters below the GA junction. Each of these are slightly different in terms of how they present and what it means. Because if you look at the nodal spread on the right, you'll find that C1 is likely to have metastinal disease involvement, whereas C2 and 3 are less likely to have metastinal disease involvement. But the celiac and the retroperitoneal nodes and the perihepatic nodes are more likely to be involved with C2 two and much more with C with three. So what, the, what does that mean? Well, for, for C with one, what I would typically do is an Ivalose, a standard Ivalose. For C with two, um, I think it's reasonable to do an Ivalose. However, if this kind of patient lands up in the hands of a surgical oncologist, they're likely to do a total gastrectomy uh, with an associated um, uh, partial esophagectomy and then do a esophageal jejunal anastomosis in the chest, or they will do a total gastrectomy and then try to do an anastomosis between the esophagus and the jejunum through the abdomen. So uh, C word three, I think, should ideally get a total gastrectomy, whereas C word one and C word two would would benefit with just an Ivor Lewis. You could probably go a little further out in the stomach and get better margins, but that's how I would take care of the C word regions, especially two and three. Coming to minimally invasive esophagectomy, well, minimally invasive esophagectomy is less morbid. Um, as you can see to the left, the rocotomy is painful, it hurts, high chance of pneumonia. If you're doing an MIE, um, all of that is less likely. Uh, I think our expertise with MIE is gradually increasing. Although that being said, I think this is the kind of operation that ought to be done in a place that gets a steady flow of esophagectomies at least 20 to 25 a year, and you have the right kind of help to get you through that kind of operation. Typical operative time for an, for an Ivor Lewis, open Ivor Lewis in my hands is about four or five hours. If I were to do an MIE that would turn into a seven, eight hour deal. It's a long day. Uh, and you know, the, the, the odd thing about this operation is the most important step of this operation is the one that you're doing in the last 10 minutes, the anastomosis between the esophagus and the stomach. And so, uh, operations that go that long, there's a lot of fluid shifts involved, pressure requirements. I think if you had the right kind of expertise with the right kind of volume, minimally invasive esophagectomy is definitely a better operation, but uh, it's not for everybody. So uh, port placement for minimally invasive esophagectomy, uh, I do 10 millimeters, so two 10 millimeter in, uh, ports in a paramedian fashion, one third of a distance between the xiphoid and the, and the uh, and the suprapubic area. Uh, and then I use one five millimeter here to retract the liver. It's this kind of squiggly, I call it Mr. Squiggly Retractor here to retract the left over the liver. And then we'll put two five millimeter incisions here. Same operation, create a stomach tube, do a pyloromyotomy, and then do a J-tube. For the J-tube now, there are, there are uh, percutaneous devices you get. 
where you can bring the jejunum up and then put a needle in, guide wire in, and then deploy this, this J tube. The problem with that J tube though is it's it's usually about 12 or 14 trench. So it's good for tube feeds, but it's not good for meds. It easily clots. So I'm always worried that some of the medications that the patient will get through that tube will result in the tube clogging. Now, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about palliative options. Um, majority of the esophagus cancers that come to us come at a very late stage. Um, in, in India, I'm sure almost everybody must be coming in a late stage. And so uh, what are the palliative options? So there's endoscopic palliative options, and I'll talk a little bit about stents and dilations, and of course, feeding tubes, um, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomies if, if amenable, or, or open J-tube or laparoscopic J-tube. Esophageal stents, um, uh, we do, I do a lot of stenting. Uh, they're kind of uh, fairly easy to deploy now. Uh, many companies are into this. Medtronic is the, probably the largest um, and they're available quite freely in most, in most centers here. In terms of determining what kind of stent you're gonna use, you wanna know the length of the tumor and you wanna put a stent that's at least a couple of centimeters above and a couple of centimeters below. Two, if the stent extends to more than 18 centimeters from your teeth, so above the cricopharyngeus, patient's gonna feel it. So cricopharyngeus is around where they have this foreign body sensation, which is terrible. So you don't want a stent that's very high up. The patient's gonna feel like there's something in the neck. And the second thing is, if a stent goes past the GA junction, it creates free reflux. So those are the considerations that, that you gotta have, is if the stent is going past the GA junction, invariably patients will have severe reflux because the acid just keeps on going past the stent. Maybe it's palliative and there's no other way out, but that creates a unique scenario. And also the tortuosity of the esophagus matters. The typical way in which I would deploy a stent is uh, um, I, I'll do an endoscopy first, a useful endoscopy in the room. I'll, I'll put the upper endoscope in. I'll take a little safety pin and I'll mark the site, the bottom portion of where the bottom end of the stent should be. Then I'll take another safety pin using fluoroscopy. I'll mark where the proximal end of the stent should be. That'll give me a sense of how much of a length I get. And then I look at the various sizes. Typically they're 18 millimeters, some of them are two centimeters. Um, the bigger the stent, the more it kind of creates pain for the patient, but it's better long-term. All of these stents are covered stents and they're expandable stents. Uh, they're made of titanium and then there's cupboards on top. So they're kind of always pushing outwards. Um, and then I'll put a guide wire in um, and then deploy the stent blindly using fluoroscopy without endoscopic support. And as I'm deploying it, I'll use those two safety pins as a measure of how, uh, how, how well they're deployed. If necessary, you can always put a balloon dilator in there and dilate the stent to conform to the shape. Um, you can also use stents for complications of esophageal cancer, esophageal fistula. If suppose patient has a tracheoesophageal fistula, I had a patient similar to that the other day, uh, you could put a stent in the esophagus and one in the trachea. This is by far purely palliative. The patient literally has maybe just weeks or months left to live. And you have a stent, one in the trachea and one in the esophagus. Um, you can use stents for leaks after an esophagectomy. Um, you know, so typically how that would be managed would be you would have IR, put a pigtail in, put the patient on antibiotics, and then have a stent placed. Uh, and then, of course, feeding access. Um, Yes, um, that's about it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I've tried to be as comprehensive as possible in the last hour, uh, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Thank you very much, Parish. That was just an absolutely brilliant lecture. I, I love the way you laid it on very clearly, very lucidly. So it was a fantastic lecture and really, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much, Parish. Um, if, if you're okay with time, Paresh, can we ask you some questions? Is that okay? Yes, it's a Sunday. It's a beautiful day out, so I'm, I'm, I'm all good. 
I promise you, we won't keep you too long. Just a few questions, just to get a few things uh, across. So before we start talking about uh, cancer esophagus, can you tell us what is the role of surveillance in management of cancer esophagus? Is there a national surveillance strategy in the US? Should India follow a surveillance strategy? What's your take on that? <clears throat> no, there is no surveillance available for esophagus cancer. Um, it just wouldn't make a lot of sense because these are, as I said, fairly, uh, they're not very common. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't use the word uncommon, but they're not very common. Uh, you would have to scope a lot of people to pick one, one cancer. But in patients who have reflux disease, especially those who are on PPIs for a prolonged period of time, that should warrant a need for an endoscopy. And if patient has Barrett's esophagus, that is without a doubt something that needs surveillance endoscopy. So the role for surveillance would be only in patients with reflux and who have known Barrett's. And if you have Barrett's, of course, you're gonna get an endoscopy every three years. So that would be one indication to, to uh, do endoscopy. But I would not propose uh, everybody getting an endoscopy or anybody with reflux getting an endoscopy. I think it would be it would have to be something that we would decide on a case by case basis. But if anybody is on PPIs for say two or three years, they should at least get an endoscopy once. And then if they get Barrett's, then they should not be lost to follow up. Okay, that's that's good. Now uh, you showed us uh, the role of EUS in in the management of uh, CA esophagus. Uh, many times in the third world or in Southeast Asia, it might be difficult to get an EUS. Uh, so is there any role for operating without doing an EUS or EUS is mandatory for all cases of CA esophagus? The answer is no. The EUS is not mandatory for all cases of esophagus. I think the role for EUS is, is, uh, is only for staging in early stage cancers. If a patient presents with dysphagia and you get to a point where you can't even get a regular scope in that patient, there is no role for the EUS. The EUS scope is larger. And what the EUS is gonna do is gonna tell you whether, the, whether, the, whether it's T3 versus T4. Yes, it does matter uh, from the prognostic standpoint in the sense, if, if, if I were the patient and the patient asked, you know, and I asked my doctor, what's my stage and how long do I have to live? And you can't give an accurate answer without an EOS. But the practical reality is, if you had somebody with a large mass and you did a PET scan and did not find any distant mass, EOS is not going to change anything. You're going to put this patient through neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation, shrink the tumor, and operate on the tumor. Uh, and EOS won't change anything. Uh, so I don't think it's necessary to have an EOS in everything. In, in your slides, you showed us a picture of an US. Would you, would you kindly go back to that frame, to that slide, and please tell us the various layers. This is for exam going students. So if you can just point out how to identify the various layers of that, I'd be very helpful, please. Yeah. So if you look at, this is the anatomy of the esophagus layers. And these are the different colors to your left. The first layer that you see on the US is it's like it looks less bright, darker, less bright, darker, less bright. The first one is usually the mucosa, the epithelium, the basement membrane. The second layer is the lamina propria going on to the submucosa. The third layer is the submucosa. The fourth layer is the muscularis propria, the dark layer. Muscle usually will appear dark. And then the periesophageal tissue. So here, this muscle, this tumor here is pretty large, right? See, it's gone all the way to the, to the muscularis propria. And so it's hard to tell the various layers, but going back here, that would be the lamina propria. That would be the submucosa. That would be the muscularis mucosa. 
The point I would like to emphasize is, you see how vague this is? I can't even clearly tell you. And that's a very important point. Sometimes it's hard to tell what is T1, T2 versus T3. That area there is T3, but in this EUS, I can't tell you that clearly. So that's the point of an EUS, is it gives you a good sense if the layers are clearly identifiable, but it is clearly very operator dependent. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now, before we talk about the surgical intervention, uh, you mentioned about the cross trial. And before the cross trial uh, in 2002, there was the magic trial, which was looking at uh, use of uh, chemotherapy. So what, what uh, you know, previously they were using chemotherapy as an adjuvant therapy and now they're using chemo radiotherapy. So what's the difference between the two? Uh, has magic been made obsolete by cross? <clears throat> well, answer to that is yes. Um, there is almost no role anymore for preoperative chemo alone. Uh, a tri-modality therapy where you're doing chemotherapy and radiation, chemo for occult distant meds, chemo for some degree of local disease, radiation for local disease, followed by surgery has now become the standard of care. So to a specific answer to a question, has magic become obsolete? Answer is yes. Uh, a tri-modality therapy has shown to be better than other approaches. Okay. Now, when you operate on these patients who have had previous chemo radiotherapy, uh, how, technically, how difficult is the surgery? Do you find it more harder to dissect, or so the answer to that? Out? Yeah, that's a very that's a very good question, and the, and, the, and the reason why it is not much of an issue is typically when you finish your chemotherapy and radiation, you want to wait about five weeks before repeating a PET scan and then doing surgery. You don't wanna wait many months because the longer you wait, the tissues start becoming scarred and it becomes increasingly harder to do. The anastomosis will become harder to do if you waited say three or four months. So the, the course of events are you finish radiation and chemo and this is controversial as to how long to wait. The Mayo Clinic, they wait three weeks. Um, we are waiting five weeks. So we wait five weeks, the tissues are still soft and, and it's not hard to do. But, you know, as, a, as we were talking before the talk, uh, you know, the case that I did where this gentleman had three year lung cancer and he had finished his radiation in October and we are doing surgery now, seven weeks later, seven months later, everything was scarred in. So the longer you wait after radiation, the tissues will become harder and scar tissue sets in. But if you waited about five weeks, I think you're fine. So, so surgery is not a big issue in, in five weeks. You don't think it becomes a... No, and, and, and it has been studied already where we have compared radiation versus no radiation. And the risk for leak is a little bit higher. The thing about a leak is it, is it is dependent on so many factors, right? Leaks happen, leaks, sorry, the way to avoid a leak is to do a tension-free anastomosis with a good blood flow. So why does a leak happen? Well, you're trying to, you've not mobilized the conduit enough. Two, the, the vasculature is under pressure. Three, the patient's dry, not adequately hydrated, is having pressures going on. Um, and then you're trying to put it all together uh, under tension. So the, the reason why leaks happen is for the most part technical. And I don't necessarily agree that it's related more to radiation. I think radiation is just a bystander. And as part of these trials, have you found that some patients became inoperable because they went for chemo radiotherapy? Uh, what percentage? Well, some people became inoperable in spite of getting chemotherapy and radiation. So they clearly had bad biology because we're trying to clump all these people in, in the way in which it makes sense to us, right? We're calling them stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. But the reality is they either have adeno versus squamous, they either have poorly differentiated, moderately differentiated, or well-differentiated adenocarcinomas. And so they are very different diseases, just like in lung cancer, right? You have 
patients with uh, with a lipidic adenocarcinoma that uh, probably would have died of old age of lung cancer, you would have not known about it. And then you have the large cell tumor that went from being two millimeters to 10 millimeters within six months. So a lot of these patients got clumped as, uh, as, as early stage versus late stage without giving consideration to the biology of the disease. And so in spite of being treated with chemotherapy and radiation, they still became inoperable because the biology is so rampant. So, so even if you had operated on these guys, you would have had a bad outcome. Is, is that yes. the bottom line? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now, just a quick uh, talk about endoscopic procedures. You, you said uh, for early stage and balance, you do an EMR. Just for the sake of the audience, could you tell them the difference between an EMR and a POEM? So in an EMR, as the name suggests, let me go back to this diagram here. So when you do an EMR, you're, you see this first layer here, the, the mucosa heading up to the submucosa. When you, when you inject something under the mucosa of the esophagus, usually it's saline. Yeah. It's very easy to lift the mucosa up, almost like a banana peel. It kind of just goes up. So EMR involves you make a cut on the mucosa and you just keep dissecting that loosely. And you do it as far as you can go below and above. And that would be considered a resection, endoscopic mucosal resection. When you're doing a poem, you're doing the same thing. You actually are going in this plane underneath the mucosa. And then you're identifying the muscle layers of the esophagus. And then you're cutting right through the muscle layer of the esophagus but you're not going through and through. Now, that's easier said than done because the esophagus does not have a serosa like the rest of the bowel. And so it's not uncommon for patients to have pneumomediastinum when you do a myotomy through a poem. So poem does not involve taking the mucosa out. The plane that you've created underneath the mucosa will allow you to identify the muscle and then split the muscle using a cartery. When you're done with your procedure, all you do is take clips and clip the mucosa that you open. But the, the plane where you do the myotomy and, and where you do the mucosectomy is different. So there is no direct hole. There's kind of a, it's, a, it's kind of an oblique thing that you do for, for poem. I don't do poems. I've done a few EMRs, but I don't do poems. Now, uh, you, you presented data where you said that uh, the magic number for lymph node dissection according to your presentation, was 18. Uh, the Chinese and the Taiwanese and the uh, Japanese are increasingly going down the robotic routes. And they are increasingly showing that the number of lymph nodes that they get out with the robot is higher than, uh, than 18. Uh, I, I have heard people quote 25 yes. and, and some people quote 30. So do you think do you think it matters in terms of prognosis? Uh, do you think robotic gives you a better uh, survival benefit over an open set? Personally, I feel when you pick more nodes, it's a surrogate for good surgery, right? Like just like in the lung, when you have, when you have done a thorough lymph node dissection, you've taken efforts to pick at every node possible. You know, for instance. To give you an example, when we do a lung lobectomy, at least in my center, the mandate is you have to have three metastinal nodes and one peripheral node. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to have three metastinal nodes, especially if you're on the left side. So what we typically do is all these patients will get a bronch med first. So you made it a point to sample 4L, 4R, 7. So you've done the three metastinal nodes, and then you go off to the five and sixes and one peripheral node. So a good lymphadenectomy is a surrogate of good surgery, in my opinion. And so anytime you pick up more nodes, you've made an effort to adequately stage a patient. The idea of getting more nodes is not to make the patient lymph node free. The idea of getting more nodes is to stage the patient appropriately. And what it comes down to is good staging is good therapy because then you have better agents to give the patient after you've made the correct stage for the patient. Now, in terms of robot versus open, I absolutely agree. 
everyone's to himself in terms of how you want to do the operation. Clearly with a robot or with a, with a laparoscope, it hurts less, the morbidity is less, the patients go home faster. It's a, it's a more palatable operation. And if you have access to a robot, if you have enough number of cases, if you're getting better at it, I certainly agree doing it with the robot makes more sense. The practicality though is this. Um, first of all, you need to have enough time on the robot. My center, we have three robots and we are using it, hepatobiliary people are using it, GY oncologists are using it. Everybody wants to be on it. And so we end up getting maybe maybe one day a week or maybe half a day every two weeks. You don't get enough time on the robot. So if you had a place where you had a lot of patients coming through and you had a robot available for you all the time, I'm sure you're gonna get good at it. But my, my message to the youngsters and, and the people taking the board exams is, you don't have to crave, you don't need a robot to do a good operation. Yes, a robot allows better visualization. A robot has that, uh, that firewire, that, what, what do you call that, the uh, firewire technology that they have, that they inject into signing green and you can actually <laughs> look for the nodes, right? So you, you can use that augment to actually look at more nodes. So technology will let you pick up more nodes and more nodes is better surgery. Okay, now talking about lymph node dissection, how do you do a lymph node dissection when you're doing a transhiatal esophagectomy? So that's one of the problems with the transhiatal esophagectomy. Lymph node dissection is harder, it's blind. Um, and so it's not possible to do a good lymph node dissection with a transhiatal esophagectomy. <clears throat> that's the practical reality of the situation. That being said, if you look at the outcomes of transhiatal esophagectomy, versus an Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, they're almost similar. So that goes to show you when patient has had neoadjuvant therapy of some kind, and you've taken care of occult disease with chemo and local disease with radiation, it doesn't matter whether you do a thorough lymphadenectomy or not. But you know, uh, you know, the, it all depends on the patient, it all depends on the biology of the disease, how extensive the disease is. Okay, well, what is the incidence of anastomotic leak in esophagectomy for little cancer? So the numbers I quote, when a patient will ask me, what's the incidence? I usually will quote, I want to say zero, but I would say about 8%. The, the, the textbook answer is 8 to 20%, which is ridiculous because I think it includes everybody over the course of many years. Um, typically, one wants to be not having a leak, but I would quote eight percent, which is even even that number is high. So, so when you have a patient with a esophageal cancer uh, with a J tube in, uh, you you start feeding them via the J J tube immediately, isn't it, or, or the next day? But, yeah. but when do you start oral feeds, and do you do a contrast study before you start any oral feeds? So. Uh, I'm gonna give you two scenarios. One is a, a trans approach and one is a, a Ivor Lewis, whether laparoscopic or open. Uh, in a trans approach, uh, typically at the end of the procedure, a patient will have an NG tube and will have a drain in the neck. Um, we'll have a J tube. We'll start the J tube feeds the next day and look for, for return of bowel function. The belly is soft, they're passing gas, they're having bowel movements and stuff like that. Unless they have that, we don't ramp up the tube feeds. But uh, once they start having return of bowel function, we'll ramp up the tube feeds. And then day six, I'll do a swallow study. And if the swallow study is fine, I'll take the drain out and start giving them orals from above. What I've found is trans patients, they can eat earlier than the Ivor Lewis patients. Uh, and Ivor Lewis patient, on the other hand, I'll get a tube study, I'll get a, a swallow study at about day six. There is no leak. Uh, I'll start giving them liquids. I have a regimen where first week I'll do only liquids. The second week I'll do fulls, fulls meaning ice cream, yogurt, mashed potatoes, that sort of thing. And the third week then they'll start eating solid food. And then they have a nutritionist at home that calculate the calories. And once they're chewing enough calories by mouth from above, we'll pull the J-tube out. The J-tube typically will come out and week three, week four, by the time the tract has formed, and so it's safe to take it out. The 
I have a Lewis patients will have two chest tubes, one larger tube and a smaller tube to break. The larger tube will come out day one, day two, because it's done for air leaks and large amount of fluids. The smaller tube is actually done for a chylothorax. And so I won't take it out till I feed the patient. And once they start eating and I know there is no chyle coming out of there, that's when I'll take that one out, which is usually painless to take out. So while we are on the topic, uh, how do you manage chylothorax post esophageal surgery? So <clears throat> chylothorax, a lot depends on the volume. So, uh, you know, the, the problem with the thoracic duct is it follows the usual course in about 30% of the time. So the usual course, meaning um, um, the cisterna chile in the abdomen that sits above the aorta will go on the right side as a thoracic duct, will creep up the right side, and then underneath the carina will move to the left and open into the junction of the IJ and the SVC, uh, IJ and the subclavian on the left. That's the usual course of a thoracic duct. But typically, that pattern is followed in only about 30 to 40% of the cases. It's very variable as to how these ducts are uh, sort of formed and how they, how they work. So if you have a small duct leaking and say the drainage is three, 400 a day, uh, what I'll do is I'll put them on a medium chain triglyceride diet, or I'll keep them NPO and purely on TPN and see if it goes away in a week or two and just manage them conservatively. And usually it will if the, if the leakage is small. However, right off the bat, if the drainage is more than a liter a day, you have to go back in and fix it. Uh, in a scenario like that, I would go through the right chest and then I'll, I'll, I'll mass ligate all the tissue that sits above the aorta and the right costophrenic diaphragm. So the, if, you, if you think of the right costophrenic diaphragm where there's all that fat sitting above the aorta, all that stuff I'll, 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 I'll take together as a, as a big mass ligated cell stitch. Uh, some of the UK surgeons say that if you are going to go to ligate the thoracic duct, it's better to go abdominally rather than through the chest because you've got the gastric tube there and you don't want to fiddle around in that area. What, what's your take on that? We have always gone through the chest. Uh, the problem with going abdominally is the cisterna chile sits in the periaortic tissue. That means it sits in that fatty stuff sitting above the aorta. And you can imagine how the right cruise and the left cruise of the diaphragm exists. And then you have all that fatty tissue there. It's not easy to get to that site. You have to, to get to that site, you'll have to move the conduit. You have the gastroepiploid there. There would already be some adhesions there. You have to move that medially and get all that fatty stuff. I've done it just once and it did not work. And so my personal experience is only through the chest. I've not known of anybody who proposes it through the abdomen, at least here. And I, I always go through the chest and it usually works. Okay. Um, you, you did touch on this next question, but I, uh, for the sake of the exam going people, I want you to elaborate a bit more. Uh, you've done your uh, swallow study and you've got signs of leak. What is the principle of management? And what do you do next? So, yeah, so it's very important to identify or think about where the leak might have come from. So if you did an Ivo Lewis, again, open versus minimally invasively, you're gonna have two suture lines. You're gonna have one suture line, which is the EEA stapler, uh, that's between the esophagus and the stomach. And you're gonna have the other suture line, which is gonna be on the stomach, on the greater curvature of the stomach. Sorry, the lesser curvature of the stomach, the gastrotomy. And sometimes you might have a suture on suture because you, 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 you use another endo GIA to close the gastrotomy that you made to put the EEA. So my point is there's two places where it could leak from. A lot depends on how much of a disruption you had. For instance, if I did an anastomosis now and next morning I go to the ICU and this bile coming out of the tubes, there's something catastrophic that has happened in there, right? This is not something small, something catastrophic happened. Maybe the entire conduit died. Maybe the gastroepiploic artery for whatever reason thrombosed. That patient belongs in the operating room. You've got to go back in the chest because maybe the entire stomach's dead. In a scenario like that, I would have to 
dissect the stomach and do a spit test. If on the other hand, patient was doing well for maybe three or four days, white count started going up, then you had an empyema, I would get a CT, I would drain the right chest, and then I would put a stent in that patient. So a lot depends on the timing of when the leak happened, whether and what the cause of the leak is. Catastrophic problems like the thrombose artery or the stomach dead, you can't manage that with a stent. But if, a, but if the leak happened a few days later and you have a sense of whether it happened from the anastomosis versus the gastronomy side, a stent would work. So it depends on the circumstance. So getting tubes in the chest, you probably already had them because you did an esophagectomy. Uh, it's draining pus out, put the patient on antibiotics. You have the J2 feeds going and esophageal stenting. That's how I would manage it. When do you take these stents out? Oh, uh, if it is a leak, I'd probably leave them in forever. You know, I'd probably take them out many months later, typically about six to eight months later. They usually have a little thing on top that you can snare and you can pull on them. So I would not be in a hurry to take these stents out. So when you do this anastomosis in the neck, we're talking about hands-on anastomosis. Yes. Do you do a single layer or do you do two layers? Is there any difference? Many, between the two? Yeah, there's many ways to do these. My personal preference is I do knots on the inside posteriorly using 2 o and knots on the outside anteriorly using 2 o And I keep each suture about three millimeters apart. So I don't take too many stitches. Three millimeters apart, not on the side posteriorly and not on the outside anteriorly. I keep it simple. But what's important is it has to be no tension and good vascularity. It heals. What, what is the role of a transoral stapler? How good is it and when do you use it? Uh, the transoral, I've never used it, but the transoral stapler is, is this. Remember the EEA has an anvil that you have to actually put inside and then you have the other piece that goes through the stomach. In a transoral stapler, there's a little end that goes like a, like a NG tube and you put it through the mouth like an NG tube. So the anvil actually goes from the mouth down to where you need it to be. And the other end will then show up at the stapled part of the esophagus where you make a little esophagotomy and then you pull that NG tube like device out. So you don't have to make another effort to close the anvil's anvil end of the, of the stapler. You, you see what I mean? Uh, and then you and then you pull the NG tube like device out and then you then the anvil end comes out and you see a little orange button there. And then you make the two devices. I've never used it. I know of some colleagues who use it, especially when they're doing a robotic esophagectomy, they find it easier to do. Okay. Uh, the audience is asking you, could you comment on dysphagia on presentation? It's a common feature in India. So dysphagia on presentation almost invariably. So uh, I'll give you an idea. The diameter of a, of a adult bronchoscope, sorry, a, a diameter of a adult upper endoscope is roughly about 18 millimeters. Um, that's pretty large. Most people with a diameter of 18 millimeters will be able to eat just about anything. So when patient presents with dysphagia, they usually have the diameter of the esophagus down to about five to six millimeters. It will not accommodate a regular endoscope. So patients presenting with dysphagia to you in the hospital almost invariably have large bulky cancers. And then the issue becomes, how do you manage this patient? I've rarely seen a scenario where the patient's drooling saliva, but that can happen. But in a scenario like that, what I would do is I would take the patient to the operating room and get a sense of how bad of a deal this is. If I can get a pediatric scope past that obstruction, I can then put a guide wire, take the scope out, and then put a esophageal balloon, inflate the balloon with some radiopic, uh, with radio, omnipic, the radiopic fluid, so I know exactly where I am. And then under fluoroscopy, I can dilate the esophagus large enough to accommodate an adult scope so I can take a good look distal to the obstruction into the stomach because patients with esophagus cancer can also have stomach cancer. So you want to always be sure that you, you interrogate the stomach adequately. But I would manage it with esophageal dilation. 
other way to manage it would be to put a stent. The only problem with putting a stent is um, when you radiate these patients, the, the, the stent, which are they're made of night now, they kind of have radial forces across. And I worry that, especially in the mid thoracic esophagus, the stent might erode into the airway. So I'm, I'm not very happy about stenting them, but typically if you dilate them enough and you start treating them with chemotherapy and radiation, I've almost never had to do a feeding tube. They'll usually, the tumor will respond to radiation and then they'll be able to eat. So uh, it's just the right time to ask you the next question. What do you do in a tracheosophageal fistula in a CA esophagus? So what do you <laughs> stand? And do you stand both sides or just the one side? A tracheosophageal fistula in a, in a carcinoma esophagus is almost always a terminal event. It's one of those hospice kind of deals. And we have to be very clear about that. That's not a fixable problem. A tracheoesophageal fistula in a benign thing is another topic for a similar talk like this. But uh, yeah. in a, in a, for, a, for a malignant tracheoesophageal fistula, that is invariably a hospice event. Now, what I would do in a scenario like that is I want to get a sense of what's easily stentable, the airway versus the esophagus. Typically, the esophagus is easily stentable compared to the airway. So in that case, I would put an esophageal stent, make sure that patient can at least go home, can talk and have, have, have a meal with the family. And that's all I'm trying to achieve. Very rarely would you want to do a esophageal stent and a, and a tracheal stent. The problem is the tracheal stents are usually much smaller. And when you put them in the trachea and there is only tumor behind and nothing to hold on to, it'll erode it'll right into the esophagus. So I think in a scenario like that, I would just do an esophageal stent and leave the trachea alone. Okay. Now the management of uh, CA esophagus, which you laid out, is this part of the ESMO guidelines or is it, uh, is it, is it a different guideline? Is it different from uh, continent to continent? I think if, if you were to look for a, a, a resource, I would go to NCCN. Uh, if you go to NCCN and look at the NCCN guidelines, they have guidelines set for just about every cancer in the United States. Uh, I would follow those. That's a good clearinghouse for some guidelines on how to take care of patients if you were just faced with a situation and did not know what to do with it. Could, could you please Alan, uh, elaborate again on techniques to increase the take of gastric contents? On so, table techniques. Right. So uh, let's go back to the. I'm sorry, I'm asking these questions because we have exam going to be clear. So oh, no, no, I want to no. make That's sure that they get these. Very, very good questions here. So uh, lengthening the conduit. Uh, there's two ways. One is making the conduit longer per se, or two, finding the shortest route for it to come to where you need it to be anastomosed, right? There's two things. For instance, the shortest route from the abdomen to the neck is retrocardiac. But it's not always possible to do things retrocardiac, especially if patient has had, um, say, is lie ingestion or ingested some caustic substance and the esophagus is completely destroyed, you can't always use the retrocardiac approach. Um, retrocardiac approach also would not be used if patient had a esophageal leak and now you're going back and creating a colon conduit. So the whole area is gonna get scarred in. The other, other way to bring the conduit up would be through the left chest uh, by doing a left thoracotomy or do it substernally. So you, you bring the stomach, you bring the entire conduit in a substernal fashion up into the neck and you actually take out the left, left, uh, left uh, sternoclavicular joint. The reason why I say this is I'm giving options of how you could bring the conduit up into the neck. Uh, the substernal area is typically a virgin area, very easy to do, but it's also the longest access from the abdomen to the neck. So the shortest route from the abdomen to the neck is retrocardiac. Now, in terms of increasing length of the conduit, <clears throat> if you're going to do a thoracoabdominal approach, you don't need too much conduit because you're, you're right there. You're going from the abdomen to the left chest. If you're going to go 
Ivor Lewis. You need slightly longer conduit. If you're going to do a McCoon three hole esophagectomy or a transhydral esophagectomy, you invariably need a much longer conduit. So how do you know that you have enough length? If you're doing a transhydral approach, my trick is to make sure the pylorus gets to the cruise. So the pylorus can get up to the thoracic inlet. Sorry, uh, if the pylorus can get up to the to the to the cruise or the thoracic outlet where the right and left cruise meet or the diaphragm opens up. There will be a good sense of whether or not your stomach can get up to the neck. To achieve that, what I do typically is I'll take the momentum away from the transverse colon. I'll dissect that as much as I can because you want to get to the plane between the momentum and the mesocolon. And you want to go as laterally as possible towards the diaphragm, towards the duodenum. Secondly, you want to keep the conduit not skeletonized, but you don't want a bulky momentum in it because momentum adds bulk to it. So the gastroepiploic sits about two to three centimeters lateral to the greater curvature of the stomach. And as it comes to its very end, there's a bare area where the short gastric vessels, they kind of uh, become more and more sparse. I'll take the gastroepiploic two to three centimeters from the greater curvature and go as further down as possible till I reach the gastroduodenum. That's where the branch of the gastroepiploic comes from. But you have to be careful because in big obese people, that not, not, might not be easy. The second thing I'll do is I'll do a coker maneuver. So I'll, I'll lift the duodenum, bring it medially, and separate out all the peritoneal attachments from it laterally so that the duodenum gets straightened out as much as possible. But with these two maneuvers, I should be able to get the pylorus up to the cruise. And then I know that I have enough length to get up to the neck. Okay. The, as, you know, as you know, in the esophagectomy, you cannot do an esophagectomy until you take the left gastrics. The left gastric actually holds the G junction down. It's, it's, it's a tether. And so that's why you're forced to take this big vessel. So once you take the left gastric, do a coker maneuver and are able to bring the pylorus up to the cruise, you pretty much have enough length. <coughs> Fantastic. So the TLM classification of the uh, of esophagus, which you presented to us, is that separate for squamous and separate for adeno, or is it the same for all same. carcinomas? It's the same. There are subtleties in terms of the grade, you know, like grade one, grade two, grade three. But as far as the TNM numbers go, they are the same. Okay. Uh, Somebody's asking you, what's your take on R0 resection at nodes and nodal station? How do we judge intra-op apart from extra capsular extension? So uh, intraoperatively, you can judge an R0 resection uh, based on frozen sections as far as the margins go. Uh, and as far as the lymph nodes go, you want to get a PET scan when you're done with the chemotherapy and radiation to see if there is a lot of pet active nodes around the celiac trunk. And if you find pet active nodes around the celiac trunk, you want to lay the celiac trunk completely bare and get all those nodes out because positive disease at that point means you're not gonna have a good outcome. Okay. And, and any role for prophylactically ligating the thoracic duct? Um, <clears throat> well, if you can identify it, and there are many techniques to identify it, most of our patients, when they come to the hospital, they are, they are NPO, they haven't had anything to eat or drink. And so the duct is not gonna be very obvious. If you can identify it, yes, you should almost certainly ligate it. But it is hard to identify it sometimes. One of the techniques to making somebody identify it, and this is something I, my attending used to do, is they would make them drink um, sometimes almost uh, 100 ml of cream before the operation. Uh, so they would push cream down the J-tube or the G-tube uh, before the surgery so that the duct becomes more prominent. All of those techniques are not very practical. And so I don't, as a rule, go looking for the duct when I'm doing an esophagectomy. But if you can identify it, I think you should ligate it. 
And what's your take on proximal polar gastrectomy, transabdominal for OGJ cancers? So proximal polar gastrectomy, I think what that means is, I, I've never seen that term being used in my world, but what, I, what that means, I think, is resecting about four to five centimeters of the antrum uh, as part of the GE junction resection. So going to this earlier diagram that I showed, um, where is that uh, Sievert lesion? So I'm assuming what proximal polar gastrectomy means dissecting a part of the antrum. That's what I'm assuming it means. But uh, if you look at the Seward classification, these Seward three lesions, they're almost stomach cancers. And uh, what a typical thoracic surgeon will do is they'll take a five centimeter margin and, and take care of that. But ideally in Seward three lesions, they should get a total gastrectomy with an extensive lymphadenectomy around the celiac trunk, and then get an anastomosis between the a rule limb of the jejunum and the esophagus. That's the ideal thing to do. Uh, but if you have a Seaver II lesion, you can get away with resecting about five centimeters of the proximal stomach, but always get a frozen section. I'm assuming that's what they mean by a proximal polar uh, aspect. I, I, I think so. I, I'm not sure what was the question, but. Uh... Anyway, let, let's get on to the next one. Um, do you preserve a zygous way? And if, do, if you do, have you ever seen a conduit dilatation proximal to the zygous? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting and nice question. I, I don't preserve the azygous way, but uh, there was a well-known thoracic surgeon by the name of uh, Victor Trastek. He was a thoracic surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. What he would do is he would, uh, he would ligate the azygous vein and take two long silk sutures. So you're ligating it, and now you have two long silk sutures on each side of the azygous vein. And after he did the anastomosis, he would ligate these two silk sutures together. So now you had like a, another layer over the anastomosis by the leftover azygous vein. So um, people use all kinds of ways to figure out a way to, to buttress the anastomosis, but no, <laughs> presence of an azygous vein will not uh, cause any obstruction. It's actually a low pressure system. It's venous anyway, so it's not going to cause an obstruction. Sure. <laughs> uh, that, that's just been an amazing uh, session, actually. I learned a lot today. And uh, the audience also, uh, they, they are continuously trying to have a chat amongst themselves regarding the various uh, issues with esophagectomy. I, 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 I just, I'm, I'm speechless by the clarity of your thought and uh, the fantastic way in which you presented this uh, session. Is there anybody from the audience who wants to come in and ask specific questions to Dr. Mane? If not, uh, we will end the session. I, I don't mind if somebody wants to switch on the thing. If it's a burning issue, please feel free to switch on your uh, microphones and ask specific questions, please. Okay, so no, I think it's been it's been fantastic. Uh, thank you, Paresh, for giving us your time, and uh, we all learned a lot today. I have to say, it was fantastic. And, thank you. Uh, we, we we hope that we can get you to do some more talks for our students in future. Uh, of course, you are very busy with the COVID situation. We all understand that. Uh, but uh, again, on behalf of all the youngsters and all the surgeons from across uh, many countries, uh, thank you very much, Paresh. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate it very Good much night. for the opportunity. Thanks, Paresh. Good night. <laughs>